Welcome everyone. This is our talk, Conversations about the Use of AI in Art Practice. I'm Dr. Christine Veres, and Dr. Fishwick and I want to introduce you to our team of students that are engaged in cutting edge experimentations with automated and artificial intelligence tools to create art. Um, so, Paul? Well, yes, so uh, Dr. Veris and I each have our own labs. Um, she's got a lab called Experimental, um, and I have one called Creative Automata. And so we joined together in this uh, presentation with students to, to for uh, uh, showcase their work. And um, I'm an assistant professor in ATAC, the School of Arts, Technology and Emerging Communication. And I teach disciplines related to history of animation, animation studies and experimental animation. In my research lab, as um, Dr. Fishwick mentioned, experimental is the experimental animation lab. And we encourage students to experiment uh, with different techniques to create animation. But traditionally, those experimentations, they come from alternative processes of animation, which means analog technology. And, but of course, we cannot um, put on the side the rapid evolution of technology and how that is expanding even to the realm uh, of experimentations. And that's why when um, Dr. Fishwick approached me and said, hey, we should start a conversation about that. This is part of experimentations. Uh, I was really excited and we created this group that is called Experimental Automata that to start engaging students in this conversation. And this is the first event that we're creating and we hope to create this community that is interested in experimenting with those tools, discovering new things and exchanging. Okay, uh, so I'm currently serving as professor of ATEC and computer science. Uh, I have an interest a strong interest at the intersection between the arts, design, mathematics, and computer science. Uh, we live in a really fascinating time with regard to AI art, uh, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, it's, it's very new, and um, so the, the, the it's very new, and faculty and students can use tools. I mean, some of the tools are VQGAN, CLIP, um, and uh, diffusion methods, and enable to enable new design and new types of art. So these tools can be used at different levels. They can begin at the web, which is like high level. They can then go to Google Colab, which is a, basically a Jupyter notebook environment. Uh, and we also have access to the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, so I've been in this area for about a year. I've been doing a lot of art and uh, you know keeping track of it. So I'm really happy to be here. And of course, we cannot, we need to mention an important element that actually brought us to this collaboration, the, which were the early investigations proposed by my research assistant and doctoral student Gizam uh, Oktai. And with her help, we have created this joint lab and she'll be presenting and helping to facilitate the discussion today with all of us. And each of the students presenting today, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping, will have 10 minutes to present their work and we will open for discussions and conversations after that. And we are really looking forward to that exchange and to learn what you who is interested in this topic that is joining us today, what brought you here and how are you interested in those tools? What you have been creating? So um, we, we, I mean, we really hope uh, you get some. There's some curiosity going here. I think that's what one of our our main goals is to ignite a curiosity around this new technology. If you have questions, of course, Dr. Veris and myself are are ready to uh, answer, and I'll monitor the chat as long as some other people, as well as other people. Hopefully, this will be a seed for future collaboration across schools at, at UTD. <clears throat> so remember to mute yourself during the presentations and 
without further ado, I would like to pass the word to Gizam Oktai, and she will do a brief introduction of the students presenting today. And we are looking forward to talking to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Veres, and thanks everyone for being here today. We're very excited and we are joined by a diverse um, student group today, which is super exciting. Starting us off is Marcelo Rocha, who's a senior animation major with his presentation on automated motion painting techniques. Later, Nathan Sheck, who is in the Applied Cognition and Neuroscience MS program, will give, the, will give you a detailed description on how generative adversarial networks work. Jia Tong Yao, who is the first year computer science MS graduate student, will take us through the state of the art 3D object generation models, which are also referred to as neural radiance fields. And lastly, I myself, a first year PhD student in ATEC, will present my year long project titled Corporeal Crossings, along with some useful concepts on how to interpret AI in um, artistic spaces. So now I would like to hand it over to Marcelo to start us off, and I'm also looking forward to having a fruitful discussion. Okay, hello, good evening, everyone. Um, and as mentioned before, you know, I'm Marcelo. Let me share my screen real quick, um, and I will be present be presenting on uh, automated motion paintings and their use in animation. Um, now, specifically, the software that I'm working with to do this sort of thing is called eBSIM. Um, it's a free open source uh, right now in the beta development stage uh, software uh, developed by the team Secret Weapons. And it was developed as a way to do automatic rotoscoping pretty much. Um, as a sort of way to allow uh, concept artists and other artists and things like that to bring their painted work and their concept art to life um, in an automated fashion. Uh, now, how does EV Synth work, work specifically? Um, you know, just going off like real quick, like right before anything else, EVSynth is not AI in itself. Um, it, what it uses is a method that they, that they call example based synthesis, non parametric example based synthesis, as they say here. Um, and this all was taken from an interview with the development team. Um, and it's basically allowing allowing a video footage, which is separated itself into frames, individual frames and basing um, certain frames that you painted over and allowing that to generate those paintings into each frame, basically like redoing that same painted effect over the video itself. Um, and as mentioned before, this isn't AI. Um, it works in a kind of similar fashion, but it isn't directly AI. And they did this because uh, at first when they were developing it, they wanted to use AI, but realized because the technology just wasn't there at the time, it wouldn't allow just as much of a direct control from the artist um, if it was done with that. So at in the current moment, uh, as it is in the beta stage, it doesn't directly use it, but they have the team themselves have expressed uh, the interest in, in using AI to improve their software um, as AI technology just sort of improves and goes along with that. They have wanted to use things such as uh, image recognition um, and uh, things like that to improve how the software works and uh, just how like to, you know, to get the effect in a greater fashion. Um, the top right image right here is the actual UI of the software itself. It's fairly simple. You would input the actual individual image frames of the video that you wanted to put on the bottom part and then input the keyframes that you have painted over on the top part. You would specify where and when you want the effect to start and stop and it would regenerate back to you those actual video frames with the applied painted effect of the keyframes. Um, explaining it itself uh, without seeing how it visually works isn't the same as like seeing it, but we'll get to see that in a bit. Um, so how am I using it in my project? And specifically, what is my project? Um, my project titled A Decree from the Stars is an animated short with an environmental message of, of course, a monster attacking the world. But I wanted to explore the sort of thoughts that would run through its head as it's going about doing these things. I was inspired by the character of Hedorah in its debut film, Godzilla vs. Hedorah, where it is representing that sort of in, um, human impact on the world. And I wanted to create that a short sort of um, going about my take on that kind of character. 
uh, and exploring its thought process as it regretfully does what it has to do. Um, so my use of EVSynth is that I wanted to use paper cutout animation for the human world portions um, just to give it the sort of look that I wanted to. And I wanted to have the monster just be a completely separate technique from that to give a hard, harsher separation between the two. I originally wanted to use paint on glass animation for this, um, but because that would be more time consuming and everything else, I instead chose to go with hand drawn digital animation. Um, but to sort of get that same effect that I wanted to do originally, I decided to also go forth with using EBSYN because it would allow me to get that painted on um, and sort of like higher detail effect uh, without you know having to spend all the time uh, painting each individual frame and things like that. So I combined, so I, my method going forward was combining EVSYN along with the digital animation that I was doing uh, to give the character a more unique and fleshed out style and feel. So these are some of my initial tests that I was doing with the software. This right here is, of course, just a really basic um, sort of to get something done real quick uh, to test out what I was doing. Uh, the EVSYN software really likes having uh, like uh, developed uh, visuals, not developed visuals, but like high high contrast images just so that it, it could know specifically where uh, things are defined and how where things are placed. So of course, uh, going through with most of my work on this, I kept things to solid colors, you know, solid, high, like just solid black, uh, super saturated colors and things like that, just so then the software would know where like the actual pixels on screen are placed. This is the base part. And my initial test that I wanted to do was, like I said, going forward with paint on glass. So I wanted to um, combine the paint on glass with EVSynth initially. And I basically took the three keyframes from that base animation, repainted it over physically on glass um, over here in the lab. And then I would go in through the software with EVSynth and combine the two together. And it gave me this effect. Now, of course, I super, super love this effect that it has with it. There's a lot of like neat texture um, because the software, you know, sometimes interprets things a little funny. There's a lot of like flowing and like sort of droopy parts to it that I like again, were really the effect that I wanted. But because um, this would take a lot of time to correct and sort of redefine as like a solid image that you could see in motion, uh, I decided to instead go forward by using digital painting. Um, it doesn't quite give it the same physicality as like, you know, paint on glass, but it has a lot of the same effects, uh, especially because of the software's happy accidents. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of artifacting and like. Things leave trails and stuff like that it just sort of sells the effect of like this is like a fluid. This is like a sort of goo like substance, you know, and it essentially just gets uh, what I wanted across. So going ahead with the project, I decided to go with this. Um, here is more this is one of the first shots that I completed with um, using the digital painting and uh, the digital animation. Uh, on top of each video are the actual individual keyframes that I chose from the base animation itself to paint over. And on the right side here over this video is the actual paintings themselves uh, individually before I threw them into the software. So here is that base one initially. And then going ahead with the actual keyframes, it came out to look something like this. And again, because of how the software interprets these images uh, as they're being keyed out, there is like a lot of just like sort of artifacting and like things like that that leave trails and like just sort of have a good, like nice, um, like fluid effect to it that I was really aiming for with this. Another example is this right here. Again, these three frames on the left were the actual individual base parts. And like I mentioned before, because of the software, how it sees these individual frames, I kept everything to just basically uh, super saturated solid colors, just so it would know where things are placed on the screen. And here is uh, that final output video. Uh, a quick thing to mention here also is uh, this artifacting that you can see here in the corner during certain frames. Uh, when there's something in the software that, when there's something in the video itself that the software doesn't recognize as part, you know, when you're choosing your keyframes, uh, you kind of want to choose like uh, keyframes that have 
image parts of things in it. During this animation, when the monster turns its head, uh, this section right here, it, the software did not recognize this section right here from uh, the part that I painted. So it leaves that sort of artifacting, uh, which of course can be corrected. Um, but for certain parts, it's for certain sections of what I'm working on, that is sort of a desired effect. And it can be like, you know, it can be done intentionally if that is something that you desire, which is you know kind of what I was going for. Um, for example, here with quicker motions, uh, as you can see right here, the four keyframes that I chose out of the base video and then the four keyframes that I painted over. Uh, this is again an example of more fast motion with the software. Um, and you can tell right here that there is definitely a lot more artifacting, a lot more of things getting you know misinterpreted by the software. But of course, because it is like sort of a smear effect that I wanted to do, it's you know something that I intentionally want to keep in there and see how it goes with it. Another example real quick of fast motions. And again, this time combining uh, the painted elements itself with a little bit of uh, actual like texture that I took from the base parts of the paper cutouts. Here is wrong one. Here is that in motion. Again, I only had to like draw in paint about like one or two frames and that software itself would interpret the rest of it. Um, and it does give like a really nice like it gives the effect and the and the physicality that I was looking for while also just like doing it automatically. I didn't have to go in and draw each individual frame themselves to get this uh, texture. And then the final part that I have here, uh, just two videos themselves displaying what it would be like to show uh, an animation that has been colored in, ink and colored in, and everything else, and then using that with the effect itself. So again, this is the final output of the video. And this here is the base that I used for that. And I think a large portion of this process too was looking at the examples that they have on the website that I have that I set up there on the presentation. Um, a lot of the examples show sort of fluid motion, uh, you know, very long things like that. So that's sort of, I guess, the effect that I wanted to go forward with this. Um, and that is all from this presentation that I have here. Thank you for listening and for having your time with me. Okay, um, thank you, Marcelo. Should we move on to the next presentation? Nathan's presentation. All right, hello everyone. My name is Nathan Check. I was told earlier that I was quiet. So I'm really holding this mic piece right here. Hopefully I don't look too odd. You can hear me well. But today I'm going to be presenting AI's perception in art. We're going to be taking a look at the AI generative image model of BQGAN plus clip. So a bit about me and my background, sort of as to why I'm presenting about this topic. I have a bachelor's in math with some computer science and art in there, and currently getting my master's in applied cognition and neuroscience with a specialization in AI. So that sort of technical background in mind, I am most interested in how AI systems mimic human neurobiology and behavior. So a bit overview of the presentation. First, we're going to look at how VQGAN plus clip generates images. Very simplified, easy to understand. Then we're going to look at some image generation examples. And at the end, a bit more technical comparison of the creative process of this model to that of a human. So the overview of VQGAN plus clip. First, the user provides a text prompt. As this diagram on the right here, the prompt is just city during a rainy night. Then the clip portion of the model is going to connect this text prompt to images. And lastly, the VQGAN portion of the model is going to generate the image. So again, looking at this little diagram, at first, VQGAN doesn't know what it's doing, so it's going to project basically nothing. And of course, Clip is going to look at this image, 
connect it to the prompt because Clip knows what a city during a rainy night is supposed to look like and be like, this is definitely not that. So over time, the VQGAN generates increasingly image closer to the prompt and in the end, the Clip is satisfied and looks at this image, connects to the prompt, says this is actually a city during a rainy night. So looking at some examples, I have six examples for you guys. Here are the first two. And most of my prompts are going to be within the realm of this perception, more religious, more spiritual. And I guess kind of looking at how the AI looks and thinks and generates and that sort of thing. So again, here are the first two. Two more. And the last two. The first image I actually ever created was the first image I showed, and it was with the prompt of my perception of God at five years old. And this is still, to this day, favorite image I've ever generated. And we're just going to take a look at how this was created a little bit more in depth. So I'm about to play right now a video, which is a frame by frame of the VQGAN plus clip model generating this image. So first, I'm going to start with this essentially nothingness and over time it's going to get closer and closer to the text prompt. It's a little fast, so I'll play it twice, but I'll play it one time right now. One more time. All right, so how is this created? Again, the user just needs to put in a text prompt. And there are more parameters one can alter when using the model, but for simplicity's sake, we're just going to keep it at the text prompt. And again, with that, even when I created this image, I didn't alter any of the other parameters. All I did was enter this text prompt. So next, Clip is going to connect the text prompt to images. So on the left here, we have some images of perception. And of course, perception isn't really something you connect to an image in your head. When you hear the word perception, it's not the same as something like maybe God or a five-year-old. So that's pretty ambiguous. And as we think it's ambiguous, the model is also going to think it's ambiguous. And this concept of generalization, inferring what perception might look like is actually an aspect of CLIP that I'm going to get into later. So then with that, God, five-year-old, a bit more straightforward. And again, Clip is going to connect this text prompt to the images. So then, after that, VQGAN is going to look at these images and have a general idea of what this text prompt is supposed to look like and attempt to generate an original image. And we are left with the final image. All right, getting into a little more complicated, but not too crazy, just getting into more specifics of the model, we get to even look at what these layers actually mean. So CLIP stands for Contrastive Language Image Model. So again, CLIP is connecting the text prompt to the images, and within that, CLIP is trained on 400 million image-to-text pairs, which is similar to that of a human, in that we have memories of assigning language to visuals. So of course, when we see something, we don't know what it is, we're gonna ask, oh, hey, what is that? And we're gonna be told, oh, that's an apple. So then we learn that this is what an apple looks like. And we connect this visual image in our head to the language of an apple. So again with Clip, Clip is capable of zero shot learning, which essentially means generalization. And as I mentioned earlier with perception, how perception is not typically something you visualize as an image as compared to that of an apple. Zero shot learning is Clip's ability to connect text to an image it's never seen before. So when Clip sees perception, it has associated text words, maybe like vision and hearing and uh, decision making and judgment and it may have some better images regarding that. So then Clip is able to connect it to perception when it sees that text and guess as to what perception might look like. 
and that's similar to a human in that our memories have distributed representations, which is explained in the paper by Lashley from 1950, and I'll get into that in the next slide. So looking at VQ gamma plus clip over here, it stands for Vector Quantization Generative Adversarial Network. A bit more complicated, but again, VQ GAN is just generating the image from the um, text to image pairs provided by CLIP. So again, trained on images from CLIP, and VQ GAN also judges accuracy of the generated fake images based on the real images from CLIP. And a bit more complicated, but as we saw earlier, CLIP kind of judges VQ GAN. But within VQGAN, VQGAN also judges itself. So you can think of the generated images VQGAN is creating as fake because they don't necessarily exist. And these fake images are based on real images, which are the images provided by CLIP. So within that, VQGAN is able to compare its generated fake images to the real provided images, which is similar to that of a human in that we judge the accuracy of images based on memories. So again, with that sort of Apple example, if you do draw a picture of an apple, you would judge the accuracy of its drawing based on your memory of what an apple is supposed to look like. So back on this topic of generalization, zero-shot learning, and memories having distributed representation, we're going to get into this paper. And before I begin, I do feel sorry for the rats part two had to, were subjected to this experiment, but I'm just gonna get into what it is. So in this experiment, the Lashley and his colleagues trained a rat to run a maze, and over time they removed small parts of the rat's brain and would then see how that affected the rat running the maze. So the result of that is the rat's maze performance degraded gradually. It wasn't like the rat was super good at the maze and then all of a sudden didn't know how to do it. Its performance degraded gradually and got worse and worse over time. So what this suggests is that the knowledge of the maze solution was not particularly located in a region of the rat brain. So this highlights our ability to generalize because this memory and knowledge of the maze wasn't just a single point, it was a conglomeration of the connections in the brain and a sort of guessing and generalizing, similar to that of CLIP as mentioned before. So summary, the user provides a text prompt, CLIP connects text to images, and VQGAN then generates the image. So question for you guys, while VQGAN uses these text-to-image pairs, the data and its training to generalize and create, and we use our memories and knowledge, how much different really is the two? And here's some links which contain the notebook in which you can generate your own images and some references I can send in the team's chat after this. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Nathan. Um, very informative. I, I learned some, some more about the models too. Um, we can switch to Tong's presentation. Tong, whenever you're ready. I'm Jiang Peng Yao, and my presentation is about nerve-driven art practice. And here's my background. I'm the first year graduate uh, student in computer science department, and I'm specialized in computer graphic, XR, and AI. In my art, art practice, using digital media to do performance art, video art, and XR art. And here's my Instagram. You can see my work on here. And Today, I'm going to, uh, my presentation has three parts. The first of all, I will give you a brief introduction about nerves. And in the next two parts, I will share you with two interesting paper. Uh, the first of all, called the neural body, which uh, combining nerve with body tracking. And the next uh, paper called dream field, it's combining nerve with sleep. And now I will, in talk about what a nerve is. 
uh, in computer science definition is uh, representing thing as neural radiant field for building synthesize. And you can think neural radiant field as a type of net, uh, neural network. And what is the view of synthesize? It means you can use a certain image of a thing as a data set and train your model, and the 3D thing will embed it into the nerves. And then we can get a free view of this 3D thing and then rendering a video of that. Uh, as you can see, here is the example. Uh, here, if you have some picture about uh, this machine and you put it into the nerve, and you uh, here is the result of it, the put. You can see in the middle one is the 3D reconstruction about this. And here is the reference uh, uh, provided these two video and the picture. And so if you, your input are human, you want to reconstruct human body, how, how does it work? And I'm going to talk about the neural body. They actually provided a simple way to uh, calculate a human body and make it more easy to uh, and more uh, simple to use for nerves. The paper called neural body implies the radiant uh, rep uh, neural representation with structure latent code for novel view synthesis of dynamic human. And the structure latent code actually reduces a lot of work for the uh, for the nerves, and they actually do the pre uh, calculate about the human and make it more easy to use. Uh, here is some uh, results I show you. Um, Actually, you can use a sparse set of camera view and they can produce a novel view synthesis for a human. Uh, if you uh, put a single video, like you need to shoot the human whole body and uh, in every angle, and they can do the study reconstruction about the human. And another way to use it is that you can actually put several camera view of the video and they can generate a free view point of uh, free view point videos. Uh, these are their two uh, way to use and the video uh, are reference from the neural body they provide these two as their results. And how to use it? They provide a GitHub version and you can download it and run, uh, run it on your computer. Just follow the uh, document in uh, GitHub. And uh, that's really inspired me about uh, performance art. Here is a prototype I made. I actually I hope to use 3D reconstruction in performance and you can put your performer shape of the body into another space. But so far this technology can do in real time, so it's still a prototype, but I hope it can make it. Here, if you have a full camera view to capture your performer, and they can do the 3D reconstruction, and you can put it in a virtual space. Uh, here, I designed a virtual space to put my performer kind of like that. And I want to conclude this part by talking about performance with body tracking. And I think there are four ways you can do that. The first of all, you can, you can use the camera to capture the 2D image of your performer. And also you can use the AI to do the human recognition to capture the 2D bone and the joint of your performer. And also you can use Kinect. They can give you the depth and also the 3D point of your performer. And also we have the mocap. I think they're more accurate than other way because your performer need to wear a suit or hardware and they can, uh, they can send a signal to the computer and the computer will uh, calculate your uh, human, uh, your performer's position. And now we have nerves. They can do the steady reconstruction about your performer like the clothes and the body shape. And I think there are more inspiration for the performance. And I'm moving to, an, to, my, uh, to the next part, uh, which is the dream field. 
it, it's combining a nervous clip which can generate uh, some uh, interesting geometry and I want to show you, share you with that. The paper called Zero Show Text Get Object Generation with Dream Field. And since it's combining nerve with clip, it actually can generate text driven geometry with color. And you can see nerve is a 3D running augmentation. They can use nerve to generate a 3D version of the of the your your geometry. And here are the results provided by this paper. Uh, for example, if your promotes are is like uh, avocado armchair and they can have a result. And also avocado teapot, like a donut armchair, and they have a video to show that. You can see the nerve make it into a 3D version, which is so, uh, which is really exciting to see that. See the uh, free view video of the of your uh, generative geometry. So how to use it? They provided both GitHub and the Colab version. And I use a uh, Colab version to do that because I think it's more easy. You don't have to uh, set up the environment in your computer. And you need to follow the sequence of the each uh, section. And in the config RAM uh, section, you, you can write your prompt in here. And here's uh, my result. My prompt is uh, flower cat. Here, because I changed the number of iteration to 800, uh, if you add more, you can get a more accurate results. See, that's cute. And I really like this uh, paper because I'm fascinated about its aesthetic, which uh, I want to talk about my art practice. I uh, make some clay kind of like that. And I, I'm i really excited to find out they have some similarity with the AI generated geometry. And I want to uh, make a video to talk about the artificial and non artificial crafts. Are they have some similarity or they're different? And I think my work kind of like a fake data in the, in the AI work. And I'm, I'm still working on that. Hope I can get a cool video. And now I finished my presentation and I want to talk about the AI from the computer science point of view. I think it's uh, efficient helpers. And for art practice, I think it's a collaborative friends. And I want to play with them. And my yes. final goal is to embrace them. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Okay, and now we have Kizam presenting. Thank you. Work. Okay, I'll quickly share my screen. Um, you can see it, right? Okay. Yes, um, we can. Thank you so much again for being with us. My talk is on my year-long project titled uh, Corporeal Crossings, which interprets AI-generated art as a collaboration between the human and the neural network, ultimately resulting in the creation of a hybrid body that is both um, human and machine. Um, and, a bit, and a bit of a background of um, the inspiration around hybrid bodies um, do not just stem from, you know, being exposed to the centuries old um, myths and stories and lore on human animal hybrids, but also from my hometown in Adana, Turkey, which is called to be the home uh, of Shahmaran, a half human, half snake mythical creature, um, as well as other beings like Chimera, 
um, that are composed of multiple human and animal parts. Um, and these stories, you know, belong into an era that we may no longer have a lot of attachments to vis-a-vis -vis sort of human-animal interaction. So coming into the 21st century, um, I argue that, that the lore of human-animal hybrids leave themselves to human-computer hybrids, which made us familiar with the notions of the cyborg, um, android, humanoid, and other human-machine composite beings. And so similarly, um, I believe artworks done in collaboration with neural networks represent a form of hybridity between the artist and the machine, uh, which my fellow presenter friends also highlighted in terms of um, AI, either as an efficient helper or, uh, or a collaborator or uh, basically a friend. Um, for the sake of this talk, I'm using hybridity not just as a visual representation tool, but also as a thinking tool, um, a thinking tool that helps us understand the affordances of AI, meaning what can it do for the artist and how can it um, elevate the artwork. Um, and I believe these affordances are captured in, in three, three terms, which I refer to as three Ts. Um, translation, uh, transition, and transformation. I believe every um, AI-based tool has um, the ability to, you know, operate off of one of these T's inherently. And um, I use my project as a way to sort of expand on um, how AI-generated or AI-based tools translate or transform or transit in between um, images. Because in my project, half human bodies are translated into half animal bodies and vice versa. And through interpolation animation, such as on the, um, the second image of this um, slide, um, bodies transition into each other and also half human, half animal bodies are transformed by the audience through the touch-based interaction as seen on this presentation and also on the third floor of a tech building if you are based in Dallas. Um, and to, to expand on, um, on these three T's, I want to talk a bit about the, the process of this project and how it started. I started by generating um, images with clip and we we sort of heard a bit about you know how how it operates and um, the prompt to create those hybrid images are seen on the left and the resulting images uh, some of them you see on the right and I generated over 1200 of these and um, the reason why there's so much was to use them to train them through another um, generative network um, to later create animation and video output. And as you can see, like uh, how the images sort of respond to the prompt here, like the top post on r slash illustration actually refers to um, the sort of latest, you know, trendy illustration styles as seen on Reddit. So you can sort of prompt engineer um, in a way that you know you wanna you wanna see images, and um, so the on the left you see the clip generated images, and on the right these are um, clip generated images trained on StyleGAN2, which is a generative adversarial network, um, and these are sort of further hybridized or further um, transitioned into into a hybrid form um, that are almost unrecognizable, you know, from the first set, but um, StyleGAN2 as a model has the ability to traverse through these images and um, take you on a, on a latent space journey and uh, show you how um, the model sort of creates these points in between images to, to show you um, the interpolation or how the transition works from one image to another. As you can see on the slide, it's basically taking us from point A, which is the image on the left, and to the point B, which is the image on the right. And you see sort of how the model um, fills, fills in those, um, fills in the blank. 
in the latent space. Another method that um, artists may use to elevate their artworks is through creating a circular loop. And circular loop is similar to how um, interpolation works, but with this one, you start off with uh, one seed, which is you know the the image that the the image output that you create. And um, it sort of takes that chosen seed through the network, um, converges it to other outputs, and then takes it back to its initial state, which leaving us with a, with a circular loop, as it is pretty self-explanatory. Um, however, um, the sort of realm of transformation or how it can be further actualized in physical space was of a curiosity to me still. Um, namely, I didn't want to stop at creating not just images and videos, but also interactivity and how physical bodies can interact with these vi uh, virtual bodies, all sort of becoming one big hybrid body. So um, in here you see my classmates sort of interacting with the clip generated body through um, the Kinect camera, which is a depth camera that can um, interpret the, the sort of skeleton of the body um, and respond to, to, the, to the movements of the body. Another transformation method I wanted to explore was again, you know, using the body as an instrument to um, interact with the hybrid body, uh, hopefully in the creation of again, one big hybrid body containing all the elements of both the um, interactive piece, the audience um, and the environment that they are sort of enmeshed in. Um, and wrapping up, I, I believe there are a lot of, um, topics that, you know, can arise from speculating on how human AI collaboration becomes a hybrid body, whether it is a hybrid body or who, who actually creates, you know, who's the author or who curates, um, like on the left, you see the images I put in a matrix, um, clip generated images. And on the right is a matrix created by the neural network. And it gives us a lot of um, ground to, to think about the collaborative authorship between the human and the neural network. And um, I take that to be a crucial topic to, to talk about when it comes to the authenticity of the work. And I would like to conclude by pointing out to the fact that uh, hybrid bodies are not uh, just the only ones, only ones you saw in the presentation, but us and all the audience in this um, meeting is also another part of one big hybrid body. Um, thank you. <laughs>